Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Full Court Press, a weekly online interview series where we delve a little bit deeper into the current state of affairs in the hydrogen sector and the full court press being the full effort of all of the stakeholders to get this industry up and running and get what has been historically a huge opportunity to finally make its way to reality. And as we come to the end of the half year, it's a great opportunity to check in with one of the leading voices in the Middle East hydrogen sector, Cornelius Mathis, CEO of DII Desert Energy. Good morning, Cornelius, and thank you for joining us. Morning, Sean. Thanks a lot for having me. Let's just kick off with a sense of sort of temperature date check-in, end of the half year of 2022. I would say 2021, uh, hydrogen probably rivaled the word COVID for most used uh, in, in, in the media or in the sort of general vernacular. It just seemed to be everywhere all the time, which maybe is what it needed to get up and running and get started. But let's check in halfway through 22 from your perspective. Did all the hype of 21 uh, uh, come to some level of fruition in the first half of 22? That's a very good question. So fruition in terms of uh, tangible concrete projects, uh, not so much as of yet. Uh, I think growth continues for sure at an exponential basis. So what we see in terms of announcements uh, in the UAE, particularly in countries like Egypt as well, in the entire region is really impressive. Uh, as uh, DI and the MENA Hydrogen Alliance, we launched a so-called project tracker last month uh, and we identified almost 50 projects. Uh, this we did in cooperation with uh, Roland Berger and 50 projects here, concrete announced projects is pretty impressive. Um, I think also the UAE is moving fast. Uh, actually, uh, this week, a uh, high level delegation is in Germany talking on partnerships there. So I think this shows progress. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, the Department of Energy is, is currently conducting a project to get uh, the framework right for uh, a local hydrogen economy as well. And now the grand hydrogen strategy of the UAE uh, is uh, being tendered as a project. So I think this is uh, this is all really exciting. And uh, uh, internationally, there has been significant progress. Uh, the energy crisis in Europe uh, has led to a massive acceleration. So the two times 40 gigawatt initiative we submitted to the EU commission uh, two and a half years ago, together with Hydrogen Europe, uh, has been uh, effectively quadrupled to a two times 160 gigawatt initiative and the official objectives now by Europe are to produce 10 million tons by 2030 domestically and 10 million tons imported. And obviously uh, the, the obvious choice here is uh, the region just uh, for the proximity to Europe, for the extreme low cost uh, renewable produced to hydrogen. So I think uh, in this context, uh, also with uh, the geopolitical uh, events, we see a massive uh, acceleration. And uh, the big challenge is obviously now to come to concrete action and really to execute from all these announcements. Yeah, we, we, that's, we'll get to the, the inevitable accelerator that these uh, the particularly geopolitical events may be. I first want to just touch on, again, coming back to our analogy of the full court press, i.e. all the players on the pitch working together to, to, to advance the objective. What player on the pitch are we missing or where are the strength players and what are the weak players in this full court press? I mean, one of the big objectives I know from Middle East producers is they want a guaranteed off taker. That player doesn't seem to be on the field yet. Where is the weakness in the full court press in terms of players that are absent? The weakness, uh, Sean, is clearly on the policy side. So while EU Commission countries like Germany, they have ambitious strategies and very ambitious objectives, uh, the um, challenges on execution, and this is precisely in uh, a legal regulatory framework, including topics like certification, 
you know, a well-coordinated international certification scheme is really uh, the prerequisite to create uh, a market for, for tradable hydrogen, which is not there today. Uh, second aspect, uh, again, by government's infrastructure for transporting storage. So I think these two things are the big ask to governments now, and governments need to move in this direction. The off-takers, they're generally there, particularly in Europe, but also in Japan, for example. Uh, there have been quite a few deals now as well. So the off-taker, I think, will move once uh, there is clarity on certain things, again, on uh, the regulatory side. But the off-takers, in my view, they're generally lined up. Just on that point, we started out with, uh, the analogy again that 2021 was a lot of hype in, in hydrogen, but I think the, in, 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 a, in a relative sense, hype that was aligned with the great energy transition and the critical nature of that with COP26 in uh, Glasgow and the massive commitments that were made to net zero coming out of COP26. Uh, but now in the 2022, uh, halfway to the COP27, it seems we've got into a bit of a battle between energy security and the great energy transition, mainly on the back of the drama of the Russia's war in Ukraine, that the energy security has come back into being such a big political priority. I'm wondering what impact that has had on the momentum of 2021 as, as, as hydrocarbons and, and the, the oil and gas energy uh, space comes way back to the fore. Yeah, well, uh, uh, it, it's an important point you're making. We, we live uh, quite a, a dire energy crisis in Europe and particularly countries like Germany are suffering. And we could see last week, uh, there was in the Financial Times, you know, the fact that Germany is reactivating 10 gigawatt of coal plants and is now implementing a mechanism to ration gas or to effectively create incentives to save gas as well. Uh, this is quite uh, drastic measures. Um, this is, of course, a big dilemma because uh, uh, gas, uh, particularly and diversifying gas supplies, is uh, a very long exercise and long play, and it requires long-term investments as well. But uh, who is uh, who wants to do long-term investments when, at the same time, you jeopardize your own objectives with the Green Deal and your own net zero? So this is a big dilemma, and uh, I think. Uh, there is obviously tactical um, things, tactical moves, uh, and then midterm, long term. But I think it clearly goes. And also the high energy prices currently, they obviously accelerate uh, for pure economic reasons, investments in renewables, investments in green hydrogen massively. And let me give you one example. Uh, gray hydrogen has all of a sudden become more expensive than green hydrogen. Uh, and this whole development was expected to take place uh, maybe in a decade. And now wow. in a matter of months uh, for the explosion in gas prices, uh, only gas and, you know, production uh, basically um, of gray hydrogen uh, by gas is more expensive than green in Europe uh, currently. And this is a, a complete uh, paradox and it shows us uh, the dramatic changes. What about in Asia? You did mention, and I know in the Middle East, particularly Abu Dhabi and others are looking to Japan as the pilot projects and so forth. Uh, what is the outlook, the momentum from 2021 into 2022 from Asia? And particularly, I know in the Emirates, they're very, very keen and not only keen, but have sort of put it as a real must have a ta off taker in Japan or in Asia before they really uh, move from pilot up to full scale. Uh, yeah, that's that's an important point indeed. Well, today the clients of uh, the Middle East and also the UAE, they are mainly in Asia for, for oil, uh, for gas, uh, whatever. And this is uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and, and a few others. And uh, indeed, there has been uh, blue ammonia shipments, for example, particularly the Japanese, they have keen objectives in using ammonia, for example, in coal plants for up to 20% to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. 
And uh, Japan is obviously a huge LNG importer and will import huge amounts of green molecules in the future or of emission free or low emission molecules. So in this sense, I think uh, these partnerships are in place and there are obviously a lot of synergies for the existing client relationships. Uh, it will remain an important topic. The big question mark is how uh, the gravity will potentially shift from east to west because Europe now in uh, you know this energy crisis has huge need and it's a huge opportunity as well. I was with uh, the head of the German uh, hydrogen commission of the German government uh, and uh, Susanna Java, the CEO of Adnok just two months ago. And that was an eye opener on, you know, how uh, the CEO, uh, CEO views uh, here the opportunity for the UAE uh, to look from east uh, to west and also, you know, to embrace for Europe these uh, uh, really historic opportunities to fork big partnerships um, uh, between Europe and uh, the Middle East. So I think this is for sure a thing to be watched, how gravity will shift from is east to west. Sorry, is that partnership east and west, sorry, Middle East and Europe, principally a green hydrogen partnership? Well, the difference between Japan and uh, South Korea is that they don't have a problem with blue uh, or it's anyway, we are over the colors. Europe has higher requirements uh, due to the Green Deal and, uh, you know, many other things uh, in terms of uh, a very low CO2 or emission content of, uh, of any sort of molecules it will import. So the bar, let's say, for Europe is definitely higher. On that point, I mean, looking at the again, the sort of analogy of 2021 into 2022, the, all of the hype of last year, and you said you did, you started your project tracker, I think you said we did 100 projects, um, that the, the question was last year, and again, I ask you this year, is first mover advantage a critical point here, and hence the Middle East are sort of aggressively moving? I mean, it's hard to identify where the sort of real unique selling point for the Gulf is, what's their added value that they can really grab. But is first mover advantage in hydrogen really going to be the determining factor? Your thoughts on that and how it's changed in 22? Uh, my personal view is it is. Uh, we, we are facing, of course, a dilemma like uh, renewables 10, 20 years ago when uh, companies were hesitant to invest because uh, clearly it was expected that the price drops uh, uh, dramatically. Now, the difference for hydrogen is that this uh, will become a market, as John Kerry says, the largest market we've ever seen, or Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, you know, they're talking about 10 trillion plus markets. And we've looked into this. Uh, so uh, hydrogen can be even for GCC, uh, you know, something which could uh, long-term rival uh, revenues of oil and gas sales, and more importantly, uh, up to a million jobs. That's a study we published uh, last year. So I think uh, at this point of time, the opportunity is being a first mover, setting uh, the parameters, uh, both uh, technologically, but more important from a market development perspective on topics such as certification to develop the market, to, to set the framework to jointly develop this, which is not here today. And whoever comes later, you know, just follows. Uh, but uh, the ones where moving now- Where would those standards be set? I mean, if you take the first mover advantage approach in the Middle East, clearly is, is pushing hard, Saudi, Oman, the UAE, Egypt, you mentioned. Who is the, the responsibility, as you advocated, articulated earlier, the missing player on the full court press is the, regulate, the regulatory uh, framework, the standards, the certifications. Where is, who's the source of that? Who's the, is it the European Union? Is it the customer? Is it the producer? Where do you want to see that, what is the shortcoming at the moment, where does that regulatory framework, where should it emerge from? Well, it takes uh, many place in Europe, uh, and uh, this is uh, um, called uh, the Delegated Act, uh, which uh, has been in public consultation phase. Uh, 
uh, until uh, two weeks ago. And indeed, we, uh, with the MENA Hydrogen Alliance, you know, we gathered a lot of uh, input, ideas, uh, thoughts, wishes from projects outside Europe. And we submitted this all uh, to uh, the European Commission. So all these requirements are set here. And, you know, the early movers, they have the chance to influence uh, this. And then, obviously, some are being set regionally as well. But the big challenge is not certification per se or uh, any other aspects to create this tradable market. The big challenge is coordination to have an as much uh, coordinated scheme as possible because this will make life easier for everybody. And then of course, uh, a pragmatic point of view for execution as well. Uh, and uh, let me also mention that India, for example, is a good example, is, is a good uh, case in developing, you know, a pragmatic, uh, developer-friendly scheme, uh, you know, to, to fast-track projects. Just to conclude, uh, Cornelius, with an outlook for that we talked obviously about the first half of the year, it is the end of June. What about the second half of the year, the immediate sort of H2 coming in the next six months? Uh, a big moment in that, of course, will be COP27 coming to Egypt first country in Africa to host COP. Uh, how big a milestone is that? What does it mean or what will you look for in the second half of this year to mo more meat on the bone of all this hype? Uh, well, I'm just coming from Morocco. I was uh, speaking at the opening of the Power to X Summit last week, very high level uh, with uh, the Moroccan minister, German minister and many, many others. So Morocco is for sure picking up some speed again, uh, while being an early mover, not so much uh, has happened. But uh, I think you're mentioning COP27, this is for sure the big uh, event now, everybody's working towards. You can see a long list of announcements, initiatives uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, we decided to host our next annual event with DI just before COP27 to coincide this. And, uh, you know, we are working on some grand initiatives, particularly on this uh, certification infrastructure side with uh, international governments and the Egyptian governments uh, to, uh, you know, use this as a platform just ahead of COP27 and at COP27 to push these kind of topics. At the same time, of course, uh, COP28, uh, very glad to see that this will be uh, at Expo uh, in the UAE uh, in uh, just a good year from now. Uh, that's uh, that's also a thing which obviously is started to, to being prepared, and uh, um, uh, there we also work in, in close partnership. But uh, um, now in Europe, we are waiting for the final version of the Delegated Act. That's a way big thing. And Europe, of course, will uh, proceed as well on some of these important aspects uh, I mentioned, but all eyes are on Egypt, I think, for the next few months. Well, we'll wrap it up there. And thank you so much, Cornelius Mathis, CEO of DII Desert Energy, one of the leading thinkers of the hydrogen sector in the Gulf and Middle East. Thank you for your time on Full Court Press this week. Thanks a lot, Sean, for having me. It was really a pleasure.